الدين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome to uh, the next class uh, where we will inshallah be going through hadith 20 and 21 بإذن الله تعالى of the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nabawi and uh, we are of course uh, going through the sharh uh, الله تعالى and uh, as announced today will be the uh, last uh, level uh, or the last class of the second level the last class of level two uh, of the course بإذن الله تعالى and we will continue <clears throat> if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us uh, tawfiq uh, we will continue if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us tawfiq uh, in the uh, new academic year from September بإذن الله تعالى uh, so today's hadith, as we said, hadith number 20 and 21. So we start with hadith number 20. Uh, after praising and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending uh, salutations upon the noble messenger Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the 20th hadith speaks about al haya or modesty. Uh, and the hadith uh, goes uh, so, uh, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. An, uh, an Abi Mas'udin, Uqbata ibn Amr, الأنصاري البدري رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن مما أدرك الناس من كلام النبوة الأولى إذا لم تستحي فاصنع ما شئت إذا لم تستحي فاصنع ما شئت رواه البخاري uh, it's a very uh, short hadith, but we all, uh, we've already discussed and we've already seen that Prophet Sallallahu he possessed the characteristic, what is called Jawami'u uh, Al-Kalim, where he would gather short, short words, or it could be just one short phrase, but it would have huge, huge meaning uh, within that. So the hadith says that uh, Abu Mas'ud Uqba ibn uh, Amr Al-Ansari Al-Badri, uh, may Allah be pleased with him. So he was uh, one of the Sahaba who fought at Badr. He was an Ansari. He was one of the people of Medina. And his name was uh, Uqba. Uh, and his father was Al uh, was Amr. Uh, he was known as uh, Abu Mas'ud. He said that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that amongst the things that people have found from the words of the previous prophets. So what we found, what's reached us from the words of the previous prophets. Right, there are many words, of course, but one of those, uh, you know, things, one of those teachings is that if you feel no shame, then do as you wish. If you have shame, then you will be careful about what you do. If you have no shame, do whatever you'd like. Right, and this hadith you will find in uh, Sahih al Bukhari. Now, uh, what is haya? Uh, of course, haya is mentioned here. What is haya? Uh, the Arabic word used here is haya. A lot of people uh, translate it, and here even we've translated it to mean uh, like shame. Right, a lot of people translate it as modesty. However, haya is something uh, much more complex than just these two meanings or these two words. It includes a lot of uh, uh, you know meanings uh, within that one word. And Arabic is a rich language; it's a beautiful language, which includes in one word you will have a lot of things. Uh, for example, if you see from Surah Al-Ikhlas, "Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, al samad it includes like three or four different meanings all in that one uh, word. Subhanallah. So haya it includes modesty, humility bashfulness, uh, sensitiveness, shyness, shame, all of this is haya, right? Of course, uh, we translate it as modesty because this is the easiest translation. It is the easiest way for us to understand it. But it includes all of these meanings that are mentioned here. And you will get the PDF, inshallah, so you can go through this in your own time. Uh, ta Rasulullah uh, so he's teaching us in this hadith that all of the prophets, they came with a message. Haya is not something new that I'm bringing you. Right, it was one of the uh, earliest messages that the prophets have brought from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Rasulullah says uh, in another hadith that uh, I was sent. Right, I was sent by what? By who? I was sent by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, of course. Uh, so I could perfect the good manners or the good character, the good, uh, you know, morals. Subhanallah. This is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I was sent. He's saying, look, me as the Rasulullah, as the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I was sent to perfect good character, good manners, good morals. From this we learn that good characters, good manners, it's part of society. The earlier prophets also emphasized good character. Of course, the, the, the one message that we know, the prophets, all of them they called to is, uh, Ya qawmi, u'budu allaha, 
Malakum min ilahin ghayru. Oh my uh, people, worship Allah. There is no God other than him. There is nothing worthy of worship other than him. This is uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, you know, he says, and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, was all of the messengers, all of the prophets um, message. And then in this hadith, we find that one of the other teachings and learnings and messages that the prophets all of them came with is uh, to teach good uh, characters or to teach modesty to teach haya the word uh, haya it can be derived from the root al haya right haya which means life so it's as if the person who has no haya they are like a person that is dead a dead person is like someone who has no haya they living they doing whatever they want in their life it's as if they were dead uh, you know there is no benefit in them doing whatever they are doing there are some misconceptions about uh, shyness or haya or modesty, <clears throat> um, such that many scholars have had to tell us about this. And uh, they've uh, tried to correct these misconceptions and they tell us that all of Islam revolves around uh, modesty. Some people, they say Islam is only our ibadat, our worship and so on. But we have to understand that this is the misconception. People think your manners, your morals, they're not part of your religion but they actually are an integral part, a key part of our Islam. Wasn't Rasulullah described by um, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, our mother, uh, described uh, as being, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ His character was as if he was the Qur'an. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, it's as if he was the Qur'an walking on this earth. Right? Which means his character, his morals, his manners, they were whatever we find within the Qur'an. Our religion revolves around Haya. It is part of Haya. Uh, you know, haya is part of our deen, our religion. And it's not like people think, or some people might think that, look, uh, Islam is something your worship and your ibadat and your salah and your zakah and everything, and your manners aren't part of it. They might be the worst of people, but then they say, no, 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 I do my prayers, I do my fasting, I do my zakat, and so on and so forth. But it's all interlinked. It had to, has to be all there together. <clears throat> As proof that uh, haya is so important, or shyness is so important, the people themselves, like the, the ulama and the people, they discuss this. And they have been advised to uh, adhere to haya since the creation of humans. All of the messengers, subhanAllah, have been telling us about this message. So shyness was discussed by the previous, uh, by the previous prophets, alayhim salatu wassalam. And this is a proof that it played a fundamental part in their sharia as well. Right? A key different, uh, a, a, a key that differentiates humans and animals is haya. Humans have haya, shyness, modesty, uh, shame. Animals, they do not. They do whatever they want out in the public or out in the open and so on and so forth. Um, subhanallah. Uh, someone's mentioning uh, an, another uh, hadith here. They're saying that the one who has no haya, he can do anything. This is what this hadith that we're discussing is uh, telling us about. Uh, now, haya, we find in the hadith that uh, in, in Al-Hakim, Rasulullah says that haya and uh, iman, they are two shu'ab that go together. They are two things, two concepts that go hand in hand. If one is lifted, the other one is also lifted. If iman is lifted, you will find haya doesn't exist because uh, the one without iman, why will he be uh, you know, uh, you know, modest about anything? He will do whatever he wants because he has no iman, he doesn't believe in Allah. And uh, likewise, the one who has no haya, his iman is slowly, slowly lifted away from him. Subhanallah. Uh, and then in Bukhari and Muslim, we find that uh, the hadith says, al haya, uh, you, know, uh, you know, haya is a part of uh, iman. And then we find in Bukhari and Muslim, there's another hadith that says, haya does not produce anything except for goodness. Subhanallah. <clears throat> We find that the scholars have interpreted this hadith in different ways. Imam Ibn Rajab, he gives us two different uh, interpretations. Imam Ibn Qayyim gives us a third way to understand this hadith. Um, it doesn't mean that one of them is wrong or the other one is right. No, all three of them exist at the same time. All three explanations, they're all correct. Okay, so what are the interpretations? How, do we, how, how can we understand the hadith in different ways? The first way, the first interpretation of Imam Ibn Rajab, uh, he says that it is a threat. This hadith, it's a threat. That if you don't, uh, you know, abide by haya, you're going to do anything. So this is a threat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it means that you can do whatever you want. Yeah, but be prepared to face the consequences of that. If you're good, you will receive the jannah. And if you're evil and you commit immodest act uh, and, and you're not shy and you don't have shame and so on and so forth, you will face the consequences. Allah will punish you subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then this is well known in the Quran. You find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is in Surah, Al uh, Surah Fussilat. Uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed those who abuse our revelations, 
they you know play games with our uh, revelation with the Quran, right? They don't obey it or they uh, try to find excuses. They try to uh, you know uh, find issues within the Quran and so on and so forth. They try to find loopholes and way outs and this and that, or they just completely to turn away from it. Right? Uh, they are not hidden from us. We know exactly who they are. I'm letting them, Allah saying, uh, I'm giving them a chance. I'm letting them do whatever they want for a while. And then afterwards, uh, they will see, obviously, this is a threat. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, uh, you know, Is he better, the one who is thrown into the fire, cast into the fire? Is he better? Uh, or the one who will be uh, secure on Yawm al -Qiyamah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, fine. If you think that you're just going to do anything, do anything, do whatever you want. Indeed, he, referring back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is definitely, certainly, all-seeing of what you do. Basir means he sees everything, not a single thing will hide, will be able to hide. لا يخفى عليه شيء في الأرض ولا في السماء Nothing on the earth, nor in the heavens, can hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Naam, this is the uh, uh, another translation of the hadith. Modesty and faith are twins. If one is lost, the other is also lost. Uh, it's it's a very poetic uh, way of uh, translating that. And of course, it's an excellent translation. And uh, maybe I should have brought that translation instead. But Jazakillahu khayran, uh, sister, for bringing that uh, explanation. Naam, so we have been given a free will. But we need to face the consequences of what we do. Either uh, we do good and then we'll face the consequence of that. And if we do evil, then we face the consequence of that. This is what that uh, you know threat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was all about. Now, Imam Ibn Rajab, he gives us a different explanation or a different interpretation, a different tafsir of this uh, hadith. And he says it can be a statement of permissibility. For example, is a certain action shameful? Shall I do that certain thing? If it will cause me shame, maybe I should stay away from it. Something like this. Okay. Um, Imam Ibn Qayyim says that if you are contemplating an act, and it is an act uh, such that there is a reason to be ashamed of doing it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, or, or there is no shame to be doing it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then yes, go and do that. It's permissible to do it. So modesty is used as the farq or the uh, criterion over whether to do something or not. If I find that, okay, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will be, uh, you know, shameful for doing such an act, then I won't do it. I'll stay away from it. But then if I find that, oh, haya, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be uh, no haya, rather I should do this, then I will do that action. For example, your salah. And then, for example, uh, going to a club, <laughs> right? Then uh, I know that in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will, uh, you know, look at me, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, give me evil deeds. Write those evil deeds down. If I go to this club, there will be music, there will be free mixing, alcohol, and so on and so forth. So I'll be still, obviously, I'm giving here an extreme example. Uh, but we can use it for small, small things as well. Should I go to a certain restaurant or not? They serve alcohol. Uh, should I be really be in that place? Will Allah be happy with me here? This is, uh, you know, if you have more haya, you will not attend places like that. For example, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for hidayah. Um, and the command here, the uh, amr here, is in the form of displaying permission. Right, that if you have haya, then you will do a certain thing or you won't do a certain thing. Uh, now, Imam Ibn, Ibn Qayyim now, he gives us a different tafsir. He says that the command is not what is meant by this statement. This statement, it doesn't refer to the command uh, of uh, permissibility or something like that, but it's rather a statement of fact. It's just a statement that people who lack haya, haya they will do whatever they want. The meaning is that if a person doesn't have any modesty, any haya, any shame, any uh, shyness, then there is nothing to stop him, to prevent him from doing anything, right? When we go out in, in the street here, now it's the summertime in uh, UK. And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, and also astaghfirullah, that it is a hot days now, right? Alhamdulillah, because obviously the weather is good and we like the, 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 the warmer weather and so on, and we enjoy that, right? We can go out and, uh, you know, go to the park, take the children and so on and so forth. So we say astaghfirullah because we see the lack of hayat, the lack of shame of the people of this country. Right? They go out dressed however they like, and they don't care who looks at them, who sees them, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, and, and then the uh, drinking and alcohol and all of this is increased and so on and so forth, all of this. So when a person does not have any modesty, then nothing will pre uh, prevent them from doing anything. They will say, no, 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 this is, uh, you know, we are free to do whatever we want, and uh, we, we, we can do whatever we'd like, and all of these things. They have like this concept of, oh, I'm allowed to do whatever I want. It's uh, my choice, my body, this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, I've put some rules there for you. 
So if you are Muslim, we submit to Allah, then Allah's uh, you know, boundaries are there. We will be shy. You will feel shameful to come out of these boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for us. So if a person has, uh, has no haya, they will do almost anything. Haya is one of the most important things that keeps us from committing the sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in our haya. Now, how can haya be manifested in, in different ways or, or with different uh, people? So haya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we've already been discussing this. You feel ashamed that Allah will see us doing something or hear us saying something that displeases him, especially when we are alone. In front of the people, of course, but especially when we are alone, this is when haya comes more into play. Then we have haya with the angels. Aren't the angels uh, writing down our deeds? Kiram and Katibin on the left side, on the right side, they're writing down. So we will be shy in front of the angels. They are noble and dignified creatures of Allah. They witness and they write down whatever acts that we uh, perform. So we will be, uh, we will have haya in front of the angels as well. Then we have haya in front of other people. It's a characteristic which keeps us from harming each other, from performing indecent acts. Right? It uh, keeps us away from al fahsha. So if I'm in front of people afraid or shy that, oh, I shouldn't do a certain thing, they will look at me in a different way or they, they will not enjoy or they will not like this. Uh, they will say that, oh, I'm a bad person for doing this and th something like that. It will keep us away from harming uh, others. It will keep us away from performing sinful or indecent acts. And then we have, of course, haya with yourself. Uh, a person can be ashamed of himself, herself, when they do an act that is shameful. So if you have that sort of shame at least, then this is also another form of haya. So if a person notices that their haya is uh, low, that they have less haya, right in front of Allah, uh, you know, they're alone, but they, of course Allah is seeing them, the angels are seeing them, they do whatever they please. So they should try to Im increase in this, right? Um, for example, someone's all alone, they think, okay, shall I uh, go on a certain website and watch a certain video or this or that, or a series or, a, or whatever it might be, you listen to some music and they're alone, there's no one else around them, right? Or they have the headphones and nobody else will be hearing and nobody else will be seeing their screen, right? And there's no one else that will know. But I will know, right? So haya with myself first and foremost, but also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. Uh, sorry, I should say Allah first and foremost, uh, and then myself after that. And the angels are there as well, watching and witnessing. So then if I feel that my haya is low, I'm about to do a certain thing. My dhikr of Allah, remembering Allah, getting closer to Allah, having taqwa of Allah, will take me away from that, will increase my haya, increase my iman, and maybe I will stop doing that, and I will not go close to that. And advice for myself and for all of you as well, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. So it could be that uh, in that moment you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Or you say, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. You remember Allah. Or you start saying the adhkar, you know, uh, 100 times, La hawla wa la, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la, lahul mulk wa lahul hamdu, wa ala kulli shayin qadir. Or you start saying durood 100 times. Uh, or you start saying istighfar 100 times. These three, uh, we know in the hadith, they have huge, immense benefit for uh, you know everyday life. And then uh, maybe I didn't want to do that, but instead I started reciting from the Quran. I started listening to uh, the Quran. I started listening to Islamic talk. So instead of committing this ma'asiyah and this sin, rather I came towards the remembrance of Allah. So this could be a way of increasing our haya and turning away from the sin by uh, having taqwa and having haya and shame in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we find, uh, you know, the society that we live in, social media and entertainment have become a huge part of our lives. And the entertainment industry, it's been working hard for decades, for years and years to erase modesty, to, dis to delete haya and shyness in our lives. Social media, uh, when it uh, started, and you know, of course the revolution of social media is now, it's done a far more effective job of doing this same thing, to erase modesty and haya in our lives. We have men, women, uh, elderly, children, it doesn't matter who, they're displaying themselves. Some of them physically, they're displaying their bodies and so on and so forth. Some of them, not physically, but uh, they'll be displaying all their wealth, their homes, their marital life, their family life, all of these things. Things that should be kept private, they're displaying it in front of the world. Right? Why? Right? Because they want to, you know, have some sort of fame and something like that. And it's uh, removing and uh, deleting haya and uh, shyness, modesty, shame from the people. And of course, the more you see that, the more you want to do that yourself. So then your own haya will be affected by looking at others doing the same. You have naked bodies, you have songs that promote fahsha and evil and the sins, movies that depict actions of evil and so on and so forth. Right? These are all aspects of the loss of haya in the society of today. So this distortion, distortion means like uh, changing or warping, the, it was straight, now they're making it bent, right? This is distortion of haya. With this, the iman is also being distorted. That's why people, the iman is not strong. 
because of this lack of haya, their loss of haya. And the chances of committing sins and evil and delaying our fara'id, our obligations, are also higher with this. How many times do you find that somebody is scrolling on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, and then they're delaying the salah? I will do it, I will do it, I will do it. Right? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safety. Allahumma ameen. So the, the haya itself or the you know shame modesty, can that be used in a wrong manner? Right? When we say haya, it doesn't mean that, oh, I feel shy. Uh, and, you know, um, and we're using that concept. We're using rather that I feel shy for something that I, I shouldn't be shy for, for example. Now, so haya can be abused and it is often abused and it's justified. People say, uh, oh, no, I'm not going to do this thing because then people will see me. Subhanallah. Right. For example, I'm not going to give charity. Uh, in the masjid, people are going to see me putting the, the, the charity in the in the in the bucket, for example. Uh, I'd rather do it in private, but then they go to private, they don't do it anyway. Subhanallah. Um, it could be even being silent or passive in the face of falsehood. When you see someone doing something wrong, you say, Oh, I'd rather be modest and keep it to myself and hate it in my heart and all of that. Rather, uh, you know, haya doesn't apply in this instance. You stand for justice, and then you tell the people that don't this is justice, I'm going to stand for this. I'm going to be, uh, be you know, be standing behind these people uh, for justice. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kunu qawwamina lillahi shuhada bil qist. That stand firm uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as witnesses against injustice. So it's not uh, from modesty to stay silent when something like that is happening. Right? You could see the issue of Philistine. You could see the issue in other parts of the uh, world. Uh, wherever it is, it could be in China, it could be in Bangladesh, it could be in Somalia, it could be in Yemen, it could be wherever. Uh, we see the injustice being committed, we speak out. ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safety and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant ease upon all of those people that were mentioned and the ones that are suffering but were not mentioned as well. Uh, Allahumma ameen. Uh, some people use haya as an excuse for not seeking knowledge. Right? They say, no, 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 I'm uh, you know, attending this class and that class and that class. People look at me and they, you know, uh, you know, say things about me and so on and so forth. Or my family, right? Uh, you, you know, a lot of us might have faced this where our families might not be the most practicing of families. But they say, oh, look at this, uh, you know, he's trying to be a alim, he's trying to be Mawlana, or she's trying to be Sheikh, Sheikha, something like that, right? As in they uh, tease us for being religious or worshipping Allah or, or seeking knowledge, right? We shouldn't let that uh, excuse uh, be there. Uh, we should, uh, you know, not say that, okay, this is haya, I'm just going to stay away from uh, learning more because people are going to say this to me or my family will treat me in this manner or that manner. No, I stay away from that. And I say, look, let them do do whatever they want, say whatever they want. I will continue in my path of seeking knowledge, of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase me in knowledge. Allahumma ameen. So when it comes to seek knowledge, sometimes people can be shy and use modesty as an excuse for that. We shouldn't use that as an excuse. Now, in other forms of worship as well, we've already mentioned like sadaqah, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, some people, they say, look, I have haya, I don't give sadaqah in front of other people. Even if someone's needy, they come to me. I, I say, look, look, I'm shy. I don't want to give it now, maybe later, something like this. No, we don't do that. Uh, it could be removing something from the past, as simple as that, right? But I say, oh, people will see me. They will say, oh, I'm doing it for some other reason or this and that. No, this is not an action of pride. I don't do it so the people can look at me and say, thank you. And no, I do it because it is helping my Muslim brother, my Muslim sister to remove this harm from the path, from the, uh, you know, street, for example. Um, you could be driving down and there could be like a box, uh, you know, like a, like, like a dustbin that fell into the street the wind was very strong that day so just drop the car uh, on the side take the box move it uh, back to the pavement where it belongs or in in the garden of the person where it belongs and then carry on your journey right it's just helping someone uh you know avoid harm on the street on the on the path this is also an action of charity and then uh, someone that's disabled or elderly you think oh should i really stand up i feel shy to stand up and uh you know help them or you know help them cross the road or carry their heavy shopping or something like that right we should do this and one very common thing especially amongst the men right especially amongst the uh i would say the muslims in general arab uh, asian it doesn't matter right uh the men especially the women less so but still uh, a little bit they don't show affection to their children in front of others they don't show affection to the children in front of others maybe they're feeling that oh i, I should reserve this for my house and no but to the children this is, there's no harm in showing them affection rasulullah SAW would give uh, al hasan al hussein his grandchildren a kiss in front of uh, you know all the sahaba they, they would be there and he would uh, treat them nicely and he would be praying you know he would be in sajda and his uh, you know uh, you know he called them his children they would be on his back playing and he would lengthen the sajda because they are playing he doesn't want to disturb them subhanallah <clears throat> We shouldn't use haya as an excuse for uh, these kind of uh, things. 
Now, uh, what is the link between istiqama and istighfar? Istiqama and istighfar. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَعَوْضُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُ وَاحِدٌ this, this part of the verse is also in uh, the, the last verse of Surah Al-Kahf. But the uh, ayah here says, فَاسْتَقِيمُوا إِلَيْهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ وَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ That O oh, Muhammad Wasallam say that I'm only a man like you. I'm a human just like you are humans. To whom it has been revealed. The difference is that I had a revelation from Allah. And it has been revealed to me that your God, your Lord is one Lord. Or your God is one God. The one you worship is only one worthy of worship. So take a straight course to him. Be steadfast. Meaning, istiqimu istiqama. To remain steadfast and firm upon your deen. Wastaghfiruh. Along with istiqama, you have istighfar. You seek Allah's forgiveness. Wawailun lil mushrikeen. Woe be to those who commit shirk. This first informs us that we are going to, if we are going to strive to be steadfast, times we might encounter shortcomings. Istighfar is essential to this. Um, and what can we benefit from this, right? Uh, I think uh, there is a slight uh, issue here. Uh, I just realized as I was reciting the verse that this should have gone with the next hadith, inshallah. So I'll come back to this uh, post uh, or, or this uh, page. Ta'ala. So uh, bear in mind, but uh, I think it's uh, related to the next hadith. Uh, I must have mistakenly put it in there right at the end. Uh, I remember copying it uh, at the end and uh, bringing it here and writing those uh, points. In any case, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us uh, understanding. Allahumma ameen. Naam. So what can we benefit from this hadith about uh, al-haya and shame and modesty and uh, uh, morality, right? Our fitrah is something as well that directs us towards haya, towards morality, right? So make sure your haya with Allah is greater than the haya with the people. Don't do something when you're alone, something that you wouldn't do in front of the people. So haya in front of the people as well. And then we should try to increase our haya in areas that we don't naturally have haya. If I feel that, oh, uh, I can be with the opposite gender and just, uh, you know, be chatting and flirting with them and so on, and it's easy for me, then I should try to increase my haya by stopping this, by, uh, you know, remembering Allah when I do this, say, look, I shouldn't be doing this, for example. Um, and don't compare yourself to others, right? Just to say, this person is like that, so I should, be, no, or society is like this, I should do, no. I should say rather the Quran and the Hadith and the Sunnah teach me in this manner. Allah teaches me in this manner. Muhammad Rasulullah teaches me in this manner. So I should try and maintain this rather than the people are doing this and he is doing that and she is doing that. Um, and then it is possible to destroy your haya by continuously neglecting it. The same way it is possible to revive and nurture and build up your haya through spiritual development. Tazkiyatun nafs. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawfiq to increase our haya, Allahumma ameen, to uh, help us avoid shameful uh, actions and uh, you know avoid shame in the first place. Allahumma ameen. This leads us to the end of that, that hadith or the explanation of that hadith. Of course, we can carry on for uh, you know hours and hours, but uh, for the sake of time, let us continue to the uh, next hadith, hadith 21, which is uh, talking about istiqama. And this is why I said the uh, slide that uh, we've kind of uh, added here, istiqama and istighfar, they belong together. Uh, we will come to the uh, this concept, inshallah. Um, so, uh, starting with this hadith, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, عَنْ أَبِي عَمْرٍ وَقِيلَ أَبِي عَمْرَةَ سفيان بن عبد الله رضي الله عنه قال قلت يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قل لي في الإسلام قولا لا أسأل عنه أحدا غيرك قال قل آمنت بالله ثم استقم very again very very simple words but they convey huge huge amount of meaning and the hadith is narrated by أبي عمر and then it, he is also called أبي عمرة Right, so uh, it is said that he's called Abi Amra or Abi Amr. So he has, uh, it could be two of the, uh, you know, uh, two names you could say. Uh, some people said that he was Abi Amr and some people said he's Abi Amra. Uh, in any case, he is known as uh, uh, Abi Amr or Abi Amra. And <clears throat> uh, his name is actually Sufyan ibn Abdullah. And of course, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. So here I didn't uh, bring all of that, uh, you know, issues with the name. But as I said, his name is Sufyan ibn Abdullah. Uh, he says that, uh, he said, uh, you know, he said, I asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell me something about Islam which uh, I can ask you and nobody else, uh, you know, can give me an answer or I can ask of no one except for you. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that, uh, say, I believe in Allah and then be steadfast upon this. Yeah, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ إِسْتَقِمْ So these five words, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ إِسْتَقِمْ Right, five words, but it's 
huge, huge meaning contained within this hadith. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It is something hugely difficult to achieve. The literal meaning of istiqama means to go straight, to go in the right direction, acting rightfully, acting in the right manner, allowing no deviations or turns. Right? Alhamdulillah, uh, We don't go iwaj, we don't go in a bent manner or in a uh, you know swayed in the wrong manner. Rather, we maintain the straight path. Right? It comes from istiqama, the straight path, the path that we stay on and we don't deviate, we don't go here or uh, no there. And of course, it is derived from the root qiyam uh, or qiyama, excuse me, uh, which implies the continuity of doing something. To do something all the time, continuously, not moving to the side or to the other side. Now, we we, we, we find the same concept in Surah Al-Fatiha. Ihdina Surat Al-Mustaqim, O Allah, guide us to the straight path. If I'm already a Muslim, I'm already guided. Why do I need to keep asking Allah time and time again every single day? Every single day I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then every single day, it's not just once I'm asking, but every single raka'ah of my salah, I'm asking. Subhanallah. Why? Because it's asking Allah to keep us on this path, continuously on this path, following it up and make sure it's done in the right manner. Every single salah time comes, I'm again asking Allah, make me or help me to be on that straight path. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Therefore, stand firm upon the straight path. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ وَمَنْ تَابَ مَعَكَ وَلَا تَطْغَوْ uh, stand firm on this street path uh, as you have been commanded, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu And who should stand with you? Those who turn in repentance with you. Anyone that makes istighfar, turns back to Allah, then stand firm on this path. And do not uh, commit tughyan or do not transgress the bounds that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has set. Uh, tughyan or wala uh, tatghaw, it means coming out of the boundaries of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This is uh, called tughyan. Any sins that you commit could be called tughyan. Uh, so we try to not transgress because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, excuse me, uh, always he sees what we do. And this is in Surah Hud. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says that this verse was one of the hardest and most difficult verses of the Quran on the Prophet alayhi salatu uh, And I believe I wrote the point later, but I'm going to mention it now. Rasulullah sallallahu says, Shayyabatni Hud. Hud, the Surah Hud, has caused my hairs to turn gray. It caused me so much stress, this Surah. Why? Because this verse of Abdullah ibn Abbas says. <clears throat> so talking about uh, to remain steadfast, this is what Rasulullah SAW says was very difficult because people kept trying to cause problems uh, for me. In any case, Rasulullah SAW says, uh, and we find other hadith about istiqama that be straight on the path or be close to it. Meaning that you can't always uh, be on the straight path. You might commit sins, right? Even if you try your best, you might still commit sins. So do your best and be close to the straight path. And then uh, in Surah Shura, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, so upon this religion, invite the people, right? فَلِذَلِكَ فَدْعْ فَلِذَلِكَ فَدْعْ Meaning, meaning Ya Rasulullah, call people, invite people to this religion. وَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ And stand uh, steadfast, as you have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and do not follow their desires. وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ and we understand from this ayah that istiqama means we stand firm and steadfast to what we have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah commands us a certain thing. We stand steadfast with this command. And we fulfill the obligations, fulfill the, uh, not this, not this doesn't mean the halal, it means the fara'id, right? And avoid the prohibitions, avoid the haram, whatever we have been commanded to avoid. And we should not allow ourselves to follow our desires or to be misled by our desires. This will, this, this will cause deviation. It will cause, we were straight, to be deviated from that straight path left or right. It will lead us astray. We know that shaitan, what did he promise? He promised, لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I will stand uh, hiding. I will sit waiting in ambush. Ambush means what? You don't expect it. It comes suddenly in front of you like that. I will wait in ambush on their straight path. Ya Allah, you said you're going to make them on the straight path. I will stand waiting to ambush them, taking them away from the straight path. This is what Iblis, uh, he promised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, uh, that you have uh, respite and until the uh, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you might be able to uh, take some of them away. Illa and Iblis himself acknowledges, I won't take away the mukhlasin, the sincere servants of Allah. So istiqama and ikhlas have to come together. 
How can we achieve istiqamah or steadfastness? How can we make sure that we are steadfast? Imam Ibn Qayyim, he says five things are required. The first is, and we've discussed many of these concepts before in the previous hadith, but they are so important, so they are repeated. So Imam Ibn Qayyim, he tells us five things. The first is the action is done with ikhlas for the sake of Allah alone. Secondly, it is done on the basis of knowledge of ilm. We have to know that what we are doing, it uh, is based upon uh, ilm. Uh, it must be something that we have been taught about, not just I've made it up and I've just done something, no. But rather I know that I should do something in a certain manner, I do it like that. Performing ibadah should be in the manner that it has been commanded, right? It's uh, linked with the point number two. And number four, to do it in the best way possible with ihsan, right? We discussed ihsan just previously in one of the previous hadith. And then five, restricting oneself to what is lawful when performing these deeds, what is halal when doing these deeds. Um, what is allowed. And then there are other ways that we can achieve it, right? To be aware of the akhirah, uh, to have musharata, right? Which is commitment. When I do a certain thing, I must be committed to it. When the time for salah comes, I'm committed five times salah every day, all day, uh, continuously. Then we have mujahada, to continuously keep making effort. Jihad means to struggle, right? Sometimes you might find it's difficult to wake up fajr, but I still wake up and I make sure I do it. Uh, for example, now muraqaba as well, reviewing, right? To uh, to to review what I've done, right? Is it the way I should have done, or can it be better? And then muhasaba, taking account of myself, right? I didn't do it, so then how do I uh, make it better the next time? For example, muraqaba, mura, uh, muraqaba, and muhasaba come together hand in hand, and then self blaming. If I haven't done it perfectly in the best way, then I blame myself, right? And this is a good blaming. It's not to you know regretting and uh, wallowing in that regret and uh, you know having depression because of it. No. Rather, it is, um, uh, you know, self-blaming, uh, meaning that if you look at the next point, it explains it, tahseen, striving to improve that, right? Why do I blame myself? Because I want to do it in a better manner, right? Rectify, yes, of course, beautiful. Uh, you know, you can add rectify <laughs> into this as well to uh, improve yourself, to fix what you've done that is wrong. And then, of course, humility uh, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just discussed it, shyness, humility towards Allah. And then, of course, we understand or we have to understand that this is not only uh, ibadah, right? Or not only in our salah and our zakah and our you know, ibadah, but in everything uh, as well, in our worldly deeds as well. It could be in my work. It could be in my treating my family. It could be treating uh, you know, the, my neighbors and so on and so forth in anything that I do. It is like, is it like tazkiyatun nafs? This is a part of tazkiyatun nafs. This hadith, it is a part of tazkiyah to nafs. Uh, if I have, you know, uh, you know, more tazkiyah, if I can, uh, you know, purify my soul more, then my istiqamah, my uh, asking Allah to remain on the straight path will be better. Do you see how it's linked? I hope that uh, is clear. It is a part of tasawwuf or uh, tazkiyah to nafs. Tazkiyah to nafs and tasawwuf can be translated to mean the same thing. Tasawwuf is um uh you know also uh, another word to used to uh, purify your yourself your soul your ruh until you worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best way possible we need uh tasawwuf we need tazkiyah to be a, uh, a perfect or a proper muslim right you might say okay uh this person they follow uh you know uh, uh, you know one of the madhab of the salaf or something like that but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, you, that you can uh, leave tasawwuf or leave the path of sufia alone Right? I'm not saying that we need to uh, do all the practices that the, some of the people that claim they are Sufi will do um, you know, uh, with, without evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. I'm not saying this. Rather, I'm saying that true Tasawwuf, Prophet Wasallam, he would have been the ultimate guide in showing us what is Tasawwuf, how to purify yourself, how to uh, you know, maintain this Sufi uh, or maintain this action of uh, spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what is the point of your salah if there's no spiritual connection? That is what we refer to when we say tasawwuf and tazkiyatun nafs. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for understanding. Now, what can weaken our istiqamah? There are many things. Some of them are that committing sins and not making istighfar or tawbah. People will make tawbah, uh, uh, will make uh, sins, right? But if they straight away realize that I shouldn't have done this, and uh, why did I do this? Make tawbah, ret return to Allah, repent to Allah, sincerely, never, uh, you know, vowing to never return to that, promising that they will never return to this sin. This is proper istighfar, proper tawbah. Allah will accept that, of course. And this won't weaken. But someone who commits sins, they don't make istighfar and tawbah, then it weakens their istiqamah and their steadfastness. And then shirk, in their, uh, it could be in their intentions, in their showing off, in seeking reward from others, or just shirk in general. Right? Committing, of course, shirk takes you out of Islam. But this could refer to minor shirk. For example, showing off and so on and so forth. And then nifaq, of course, hypocrisy. It could be either in belief or in action. 
right? Hypocrisy in belief is like uh, they don't really believe in Allah, but they show that they're Muslim. Or in action, it could be that uh, they know that they should worship Allah, but they don't worship Allah when they're alone, for example. And then in bid'ah, doing bid'ah or doing actions that are innovated, this could uh, decrease your istiqamah. Recklessness, doing things whatever you'd like, whenever you'd like, and uh, being reckless with it, uh, you know, not praying the salawat on time, but right at the end times, uh, all the time, th things like this. And heedlessness, uh, not knowing what you're doing, and then being misled by your desires. All of these things are things that would weaken your istiqamah or weaken a person's istiqamah. Now, before we come to the action points, I'm just going to, uh, if you allow me, scroll back. Uh, all the way up to the one that we missed, uh, istiqamah and istighfar, the link between istiqamah and istighfar. Ta'ala, if you just give me a moment here, Allahu Akbar, it's gone all the way back to the front. Okay, uh, istiqamah is the screen disappeared? If it is, I can uh, of course try to bring it back. Ta'ala, yes, I believe it's disappeared. Okay, I will share that once again. Thank you for your patience. Barakallahu feekum. Now, uh, istiqamah and istighfar. Here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا نَبَشَرُ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُ وَاحِدٌ Commanding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say that I am only a man like you, so I'm a human, but it's been revealed to me. That's the difference between me and you, right? And what's been revealed to me is that uh, your God, the one you worship, ilah, is only one ilah, ilahun wahid. There are other gods that people worship, but these are false gods. They don't, uh, you know, carry any weight, any value. The only God, the only one you worship is Allah, Rabbul Alameen, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Anna ilahukum ilahun wahid. He is one God. So what do we do? Fastaqimu ilayhi. The command then is fastaqimu ilayhi wa istaghfiruhu wa waylul mushrikeen. So the command is fastaghfiru, uh, fastaqimu. So have istiqama and istighfar. They come hand in hand. They come together. Fastaqimu ilayhi wa istaghfiruhu wa waylul mushrikeen. And... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, uh, wail, like uh, um, woe, or, or like a curse, be upon those who uh, commit shirk, associate others with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse tells us, informs us, illustrates to us that we will try to be steadfast, but we will, you know, we might encounter that we are short. We fall short of our promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We commit sins, as we've already been discussing now. Istighfar is essential in this process. It's essential, it's a must. Right, you have to have uh, istighfar as well as istiqama. So istighfar backs up your istiqama, and it helps us to fulfill our shahada, our promise. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu said that the belief of a servant, the iman of a servant, will not be, uh, you know, istiqama will not be mustaqim until his heart becomes uh, steadfast, and his heart will not become steadfast until his tongue also becomes steadfast. So all three of those are linked. Uh, we spoke about. In the previous hadith, I think hadith number two maybe, uh, about the three different ways, right? Your tongue must also uh, say your shahada, then your heart must also believe in that shahada, and your limbs must then act out the shahada or the iman. Iman, istigh uh, istiqama comes hand in hand, comes together. Now we can take some benefits from this hadith. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it's only five words, right? قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ yeah, five words. It's a powerful, powerful message. It covers two of the significant principles of Islam, al-aqidah and al-ibadah. Your uh, aqidah is your belief and ibadah is your actions or your worship. And it's a unique answer only Rasulullah could have told us. And it includes words. It includes the belief in the heart. It includes the actions on the limbs. So your tongue and your heart and your limbs, they all have to contain or have iman. And then iman is linked to your istiqamah, of course. Rasulullah uh, he found it very tough. Or well, this concept was very tough. Shayyabatni hud, right? That the uh, surah hud has caused me all this stress because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to remain steadfast upon this and to make sure that the people are also steadfast upon this, right? And then even with istiqamah, we understand, we know that we might commit sins. And the key thing is uh, to do our best. The five words are the actual hadith itself. It's on the first page. Uh, first page. I'll go back to it. But uh, it's قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ now, uh, so let's conclude with this last point. I will show the hadith once again, inshallah. So sometimes people only concern themselves with the haram. But if we truly loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will try to avoid the makruh as well. This is like, uh, you know, going deeper into our istiqama. Now, uh, we conclude with this. هذا وصلوا على البشير النذير um, uh, send your salutations and peace upon the noble messenger. Anyone who has any questions, feel free to do ask them. Uh, ta'ala. And uh, as we, uh, you know, find some questions, or if there are anyone, uh, if there is anyone that wants to ask any questions, uh, we come to the end of our halaqa uh, for today.
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una. وزدنا علما اللهم علمنا means يا الله teach us and help us to learn ما ينفعنا what will benefit us so let's hope that we me myself first and all of you can take some benefit from this uh, from both of these hadith uh, about modesty uh, حياء shyness uh, and, and shame and then about استقامة staying steadfast uh, in the path of anything that we face بإذن الله تعالى <coughs> And then, wazidna uh, ilma and increase us in knowledge. Not just increase our knowledge, but increase us in knowledge so that we act upon this knowledge. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us closer to him through these words of his Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, his beloved Habib al-Mustafa Muhammad al-Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And I hope that I can uh, act upon these and all of you as well. And we can share them with our loved ones, bi'ithinillahi ta'ala. Well, now is the time of the holidays of the summer break in many of the countries. So do try to teach your children uh, and your families uh, as well. Uh, you know, some of these concepts, bi'ithinillahi ta'ala. Even get them to join the class, labats, uh, or if they, obviously, if the class finishes for today the uh, level two um then we can of course uh you know uh go on the youtube link and then uh read through or, or go through the class on youtube inshallah uh there was one question here muslim women speaker are right do you mean that if muslim women are allowed to speak they are allowed to speak of course Aisha radiallahu anha she would teach the sahaba but there is a the adab behind this and to maintain your haya and your modesty doing that as well right <clears throat> She would be speaking from behind a hijab, like a huge screen that was there, uh, and then the Sahaba would be there, they would be listening to her. Uh, so it's better uh, if a uh, sister is speaking, that she maintains her modesty in her hijab. And of course, uh, if she's someone that wears the niqab, she should wear that and she can teach as well. If she wears the hijab, then, uh, you know, it, there is no harm in, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, appearing on a video, bi Allah ta'ala. If that is the opinion that they follow, but I see, I believe that it will be, it'll be, it'll be better to stay behind the hijab and teach from behind the hijab uh, for any female uh, sisters or uh, any uh, scholars uh, or any teachers that are female as well. Uh, uh, unless there are only women that are attending the class, then of course you can uh, uh, teach them openly. And if there are children, of course, you can be in front of the children openly. There is no harm in that. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, how Muslim... Women scholars speak on YouTube without niqab. Of, of course, maybe they follow the uh, opinion or the uh, understanding that, uh, uh, what do you call it, that they um, uh, don't need to wear the uh, niqab, Allahu alam. But uh, of course, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know uh, and I have studied, then the niqab should be something that is mandatory. Uh, wa May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us tawfiq to understand this first and foremost and uh, then to practice it uh, and take it into practice afterwards. Allahumma ameen. Uh, I'll give it maybe one more minute if there is any other questions. Uh, what about teaching Arabic to children, boys, up to what age can we teach as a female? You can teach them up to the age of puberty. Now, the age of puberty differs between each boy, but generally between uh, or up to the age of 12, 13, not beyond that. When they reach 13, 14, then we shouldn't teach them uh, as a female without uh, keeping our uh, hijab uh, on or keeping the niqab if you are wearing the niqab. If we design patterns which companies buy and they make new dress, the design creator will be sinful. You will not be sinful. Uh, if what you have created is halal, right, you will not be sinful for the one that buy whatever they've buy, uh, bought and used it for haram. Um, I can be producing glasses. Someone can buy the glasses, right? Glass, you know, like something that you drink water from. Someone can buy the glass and serve alcohol in it. Uh, why should I be blamed? I will not be blamed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um... When my husband is leading the salah, he makes a mistake while reading. Can I correct him as a woman? You should uh, clap your hand uh, just to bring the awareness. Um, and uh, it is better not to correct him like this. Let him realize that, okay, he made a mistake and correct uh, himself. But if he's stuck, um, at the end, just uh, to say a couple of words. Uh, to correct that, inshallah, uh, it will be fine, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as forgiveness if I have answered this in the wrong manner. But as far as I can remember, this is the, uh, you know, this would be allowed, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Better uh, if he if you just clap and he realizes that, okay, I made a mistake and he can correct it, alhamdulillah. If you couldn't correct, then uh, just say the correction very quickly. And inshallah, it should be fine, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. I really appreciate some of the comments. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, bless all, everyone that asked any question. Bless anyone that didn't ask questions but is benefiting from the questions as well. Allahumma ameen. 
Can you make dua for the unmarried sisters? Of course, we, uh, we, we make dua for the uh, sisters that are unmarried. And of course, we make dua for the brothers that are unmarried as well. Because without the uh, unmarried brothers, the unmarried sisters cannot get married. So we make dua for all of those that are seeking to get married. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them with righteous, uh, with righteous spouses. Those that will be uh, helping them in their journey to uh, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the journey of life. And bless all of you with righteous offsprings. Those that are married already and those that are unmarried. Let you find those righteous spouses and then you can uh, have righteous offspring. Allahumma ameen, ameen, ameen. Uh, let us conclude with this. This is a beautiful dua to conclude with then. Aqulu qawli hadha, subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Bear in mind that the admins, inshallah, will be communicating with you on the groups, on the WhatsApp groups, about the uh, examination or the quiz at the end of the level, uh, end, end of the level two. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us husn al-khatimah, just as he has allowed us to uh, grant, uh, you know, and uh, that just as he has allowed us to end this uh, beautiful class in a Good manner. <clears throat> We say Alhamdulillah, Alladhi bi ni'matihi tatimmu salihat. All praise and glory be to Allah with his blessings, uh, with his ni'mah. We have been able to complete this uh, salih uh, action, or this good action, good deed. Uh, and bi ta'ala, if Allah grants us hayat and permission, we will conclude uh, and continue rather uh, next uh, term bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Naam, there is a couple of more questions. Uh, we did want to conclude. Okay, no more questions, inshallah. There's two here. Let's uh, quickly answer those uh, and then uh, we will conclude, uh, for, you know, uh, for good, inshallah. Is wearing a sports dress, top and pants for a girl who is not mature yet is allowed for practice? In my opinion, it is better not to let uh, the young girls wear these kind of things, uh, especially when they're becoming like, uh, you know, uh, until the age of maybe five, six, uh, you can uh, overlook that. From that age, it is better to get them to practice modest clothing because then... When they're used to this, they will want to keep this going when they are getting older. So better from when they're six, seven. But at the age of five, maybe let them wear their shorts and uh, whatever it might be. But from that age onwards, because now they are also understanding let, let them teach them that, look, this is not modest. This is not something that we should be uh, wearing. Even though we see that people around us are wearing that, we should try to avoid that ourselves. This is better for the for the tarbiyah as well, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Uh, Another question, you must enjoy your break. This is a comment. Barakallahu feekum. We'll try to enjoy and everyone else try to enjoy as well uh, the break. ta'ala. Can I pray tahajjud without praying shafa uh, and witr? Um, Naam, you can pray tahajjud without the shafa and the witr, but the witr should be prayed every day. Um, so if someone has already prayed the witr, they can pray the tahajjud. Uh, or if you've uh, prayed the tahajjud, you should pray the witr at the end. Ta'ala. The, the Prophet ﷺ, he wouldn't miss this, right? It's something. Uh, he says that this is one of the sunnah I would not miss. And next time will be 8th of uh, September, not August. Ta'ala. So we're taking the summer break, inshallah. I do have other family commitments, uh, weddings to attend and so on and so forth. Especially the weekends get very, very busy in the summer. So uh, we need that break. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone, bless the admins, bless every single person that... Uh, um, has joined. I want to become a midwife in the UK and a win win but they wouldn't allow me to wear it. Um, you can find uh, you know another job if that's possible. Uh, if you if you feel that uh, they would not allow you and the niqab is farther upon you, you understand that. So then this job would not be suitable for you. You can uh, go to one of the Arab countries. This is something you can explore to go to, uh, because they would uh, be ta'ala allow that. Uh, be ta'ala. And they will conclude with that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayik. And see you soon. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.